worship alongside of us and to spend time in the word with us as well. If you would take your Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. What a gift of grace to hear the words of Psalm 46 this morning. That in all of our going out and coming in and everything that goes on in the world around us, that we can hear, close my eyes as Sean was finishing reading uh, that particular psalm. Because although it's not God's voice, they are His very words. And to hear, I'm going to read them again. They were, that was fantastic. And all of the angst we have, and all of the difficulty that we face, in all of the ups and downs of the politics and the breaking down of the society around us, the difficulties we face at work and our families and whatever else may have befallen you in this past week, friends, hear these words from the mouth of the Creator God. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. What we did this morning in praising the name of the living God was but just a foretaste of what one day will be eternally, and that is everyone praising the name of God. If you look around in our day and age and you wonder what's going on, what is the problem, the problem is the name of God is not revered and it is not exalted. But we can be still knowing that we are in his hands, those he has brought to Christ. So back to Ephesians chapter 4 and where I meant to begin this morning been here for some weeks and again the drive in chapter 4 is that we in the body of Christ those who are redeemed by the very blood of Christ brought near brought back to spiritual life by the work of the spirit regenerated unto faith that we should be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And last week we learned in the beginning of verse 14 of chapter 4 of the letter to the Ephesians, Paul exhorts in light of this uh, seeking to be eager to maintain unity in the church that we are to grow up into Christ and no longer stand in a childish faith. And then he kind of described what that childish faith was, that it's a, a faith that is, is, is guided by the fickleness of our heart, by the, the, the angst that comes out of our hearts. But we want this, and we want that, and we need this comfort and that comfort. And all of what we think in our hearts tends to rule so much of modern religion. But Paul here says, for the sake of the unity of the church, don't allow your heart, which is like a tossing wave, taking you here and there, don't allow your heart to rule in the church. Don't be carried away or taken or deceived by every wind of doctrine, he says. Don't be, don't be apprehended. The picture there is one that is stark and strong that uh, children can be abducted very quickly. Well, if we stand in a childish faith, allowing our heart to rule the theology and the doctrine of the church, then we will be taken away. Is what Paul is saying. You see, what Paul has done is he is encouraging us again to unity. And in, in doing so, he warns the church that it is her tendency, that it is your tendency and my tendency to be childish, to be fickle of heart, to be deceived by what we see around us, to not actually be rooted in doctrine and to think lightly of it. It's interesting how little we hear of the warnings like these in Scripture, how, how infrequent they are preached. But in fact, they are 
uh, the normal type of discourse if you know your Bible well. Our Lord himself in Matthew chapter 7 verse 15 said this, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Matthew chapter 24, he says this, Therefore, if anyone says to you, look here, is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Paul would write in Acts chapter 20 as he is admonishing the elders, the plurality of leaders in the church there in Ephesus, the ones who have, would have received the very letter that we have been studying for some time. He, he, he warns them in Acts chapter 20, starting in verse 29, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things, to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. He's warning the church there. These warnings tell us that in the church throughout the ages, from the time that Christ rose and ascended to the right hand of God the Father, that things are not always and most often are not as they seem. Outward appearances can be very deceiving. Churches can look like they are filled with people who really love the Lord and the hustle and bustle can deceive us. In fact, that is the very point of what Paul writes to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 when he explains to them that Satan can transform himself into the appearance of even an angel of light. We must not be deceived by appearances. The entire letter to the, Galatia, the church at Galatia is just an extended warn, warning about false teachers, those who would add to the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Philippians, Paul says in verse 3, look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. In Colossians, he says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of this world and not according to Christ. And for those of you who have been here on Wednesday night, you have learned that the entire book of Jude is one solid final red flag that is being raised before the church for all of time. And that is a warning that there will be those who follow the errors of this world and not the living Christ. And so stand and contend for the faith. That is Jude's intention. It is a warning. You see, the Bible is full of polemical, that is, attacks against falsehood, polemical arguments. Uh, it is full of reasonings. We live in a day and age that says that the ministry is about having the widest smile and always being jovial and never dealing with the hard things of life. But if the ministry is about having a smile that's a mile wide and positive thoughts and an upbeat outlook on everything, then I would contend with you this morning, the biblical record would tell us that Paul is an abject failure because we constantly find him warning the church. We constantly find him ringing the bell to wake a sleeping church to the theological dangers that are all around her. But of course, we know that the Apostle Paul was, in fact, not a failure. He was carried about by the very Spirit of God to write the things that he wrote. He is, in fact, laying down a good foundation for a solid shepherd. That shepherds who truly love the flock of God will not play spiritual games, but will warn of the weight of doctrine and of the multitude of fallacies that surround the bride of Christ in this world. I think warning labels, I don't know about you friends, but warning labels can be almost comical. You buy a new mower and you look down and there's a big label that tells you when the mower is going not to stick your hand in there. And you think to yourself, that is only there 
because somebody did that. But the sad reality of this world and the words of our Lord Jesus Christ who, say, who tells us that broad is the way that leads to destruction. The difference between the warnings you will find on your products in our day and age and the warnings of old that are recorded in Scripture is simply this, that they're not there because a few people have erred and followed heresy. But they are there because the vast multitude of the generations behind us have fallen into error. And that should sober us. It should break our hearts. It should humble us. It should bring us to the feet of Christ this morning, knowing that we need His grace to be awoken from our doctrinal lethargy that we might actually immerse ourselves in the Word of God not to, not to merely find some sort of religious convenience, but that we might be corrected in all of our own error. You see, Paul wrote in that 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians, but I am afraid that as a serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. That is our aim as a church, is it not? That we would have a pure and sincere devotion to Christ. If we are going to have that, we must hear the warnings of Scripture. And so I would ask that you rise to your feet this morning and feel the weight of the words that, are carried, that have carried along our brother, the Apostle Paul, as he writes, again, Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, till we attain to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried, around, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. These are the words of Christ to you this morning, beloved. Would you pray with me? Father God, we come before you this morning humbled, knowing that we err often and that we depart from the truth, that we too often ignore the words of our brother Jude to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the faith, and we think your words too trite. Father, would you heal our hearts? Would you awaken us this morning? Would you help us to understand the weight of doctrine? The need for us to have right belief so that we might live rightly before you. Father, you, shed, you sent your son to shed his blood so that we might have the promise of heaven, yes, but also that we might have life and that more abundantly here. Father, we would be deceived to believe the abundant life is one filled with error. So I pray this morning that you would cleanse our hearts and wake us up yet afresh and anew to the truth of your word. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. Again, warnings are interesting things, and we refuse them often for a multitude of reasons. I think the gentleman in this room will probably resonate with this more than ladies. The doctors often warn us about our diet or our lifestyle and that we need to change this or that. And walking away from those warnings, our first thought is, well, that's no fun. I don't want to have to eat lettuce. I don't want to have to eat what they want me to eat. Weather warnings come into our lives. I think it was last week I talked about uh, the fact that in Missouri... Weather warnings come so often that we, as soon as the, the, the tornado sirens go off, we run outside to see what's going on. And part of that is that we're really not sure that the warning that has been given it can really be taken seriously. 
Parents find often that their children don't heed their warnings simply for a lack of trust or because they feel they know better. Failure to follow through often on the part of parents uh, with consequences is a recipe for warnings later in life going unheeded, being completely ignored. But friends, if we're humble before the Lord this morning, isn't this what we do with the warnings that he gives to us? But they shouldn't be. They shouldn't be our reactions. We should turn from our ways. We should turn in repentance and obey God. We should read often and commit to memory these warnings because they are given to us from the spirit of the living God that we might not fall into error. And we should trust that God is in fact truthful. He's not raising warning flags just to see if we'll respond, but because the opposite side of the error is often spiritual ruin. We should also be reminded, I find so often in the church today, and we love to give people the promises of heaven, and we should to those who are genuinely in Christ, but we neglect so often to raise before them the judgment seat of Christ that we all will give an account for what we have done in this body. Heaven will be long and eternity glorious, but the throne of Christ is not something to trifle with, church. We must hear the warnings of Scripture. I've given you... In all of the verses this morning in the introductions, the strong language that the Bible gives about false teachers, that they are ravaging wolves, blind guides, dogs, whitewashed tombs. These are, in fact, serious thoughts. And some people will shirk them off as nothing more than a fairy tale. But I promise you this morning, beloved, on the word, Robbie, hear me. On the word of the living God, son, these warnings are true. And the evil forces that surround you and I and our family and our church family are not a fairy tale, but are alive and active and arrayed against the church. And dare I even say this morning, all you need to do to hear falsehood, to hear false doctrine, is not to go and turn the secular uh, radio on, but to go and turn the Christian radio station on. And you will hear false teaching constantly that has crept in from among us. We have lived, you see, friends, so long under the subtle lies that we don't even notice them. And in fact, when the subtlety of those lies are rebuked in our generation, the religious people of our day get a little bit offended because mm, that's what I've always believed. Well, friends, aren't you grateful this morning? That the God of the heavens has not, have, has not left you to the false belief of this world, but has given you the substantial word that he has laid before you that you might turn from the lies that are pandered and believe him at his word. In the face of all of these warnings, we often say things like this. Doctrine just simply doesn't matter. Or, look... My, relation, my, my faith is about a relationship. It's not about rules. And Satan smiles when we say things like that. Because he himself has supplied for us a thousand voices to scratch our itching ears. And we crave so often not the word of the Lord, but for our ears merely to be tickled. You see, the question is, friends, Paul is admonishing the church in Ephesians, the church that he wrote to their elders that fierce wolves would creep in among them, not sparing the flock. He's writing to them this morning, as we learned last week, that they need to go on from a childish faith, that they need to go on from allowing their heart to rule the church and allow his word to rule the church. That's what he's writing. Well, the question is, how did the church get there? How, how did the church come to a point where we are more prone to be ruled by false teachers than by the clear, lucid thoughts of God? How did we arrive here? Well, the Apostle Paul is going to give us three succinct ways in which we have arrived in letting doctrine be dismissed. 
in letting doctrine be something we think light of. Friends, I want you to understand, and I want to press upon you this morning, that as you, con- as you consider the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fact that He died to bring Himself glory, and to glorify the Father, and bring to completion the plan of redemption, and that the, 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 that the reality for the believer is that he, he, he has given us the abundant life. I want you to believe with all clarity this morning that part of the abundant life is clear doctrine, is right thinking about who God is. So how did the church get to a place where she is childish in her faith? How have we arrived at that point in the modern American church of our day? Well, Paul tells us first that we are carried away. And how are we carried away? But by every wind of doctrine. Paul has admonished for the sake of unity our growth in Christ that we may no longer be children with our hearts leading us this way and that way and our heart wanting this thing and that thing. We are like crashing waves moving in every direction. We have been carried away or taken by, in fact, every wind of doctrine. Now, I want you to think about that phrase, every wind of doctrine. Don't just pass that over in your Bible. It is written by an omnipotent spirit of the living God so that you might be warned this morning, friend. It is written for your sake. When when we come to that picture of every wind of doctrine, it suggests something that comes from all directions. From the north and the south and the east and the west, the wind is a stirring thing and moving from every direction. And so it is for the church today that false teaching comes from every direction, from outside the church and inside the church, from inside our nation and around the world, from our dearest friend and our family member. We are literally, friends, surrounded by lies and errors and false teaching. And so, my question this morning, and I want this to wake you up. If this is true, if you stand and believe that this book is the very word of Christ, and it is true, and these warnings should be leveled, why is it that we no longer hear about them from our national pulpits? Why is it that so many people would encourage that we just blow off doctrine as being divisive. If this is true, why do we no longer have pastors warning their flocks about doctrine? I would contend with you this morning, it is because there is a subtle demonic leading in the church today. Because it is Satan who would have us to dismiss doctrine, not God. The church has always been, in fact, surrounded by lies. So, so, some people will, will, will uh, approach their faith this way. Well, uh, uh, Jay, I'm just not into doctrine. I, I really just want to have a good relationship with Jesus. It, it's about relationship, not rules. So, so I just, I, 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 really, I, I really don't think doctrine is that important. What you are saying when you say statements like that, church, is I really don't think right thinking about God is that important. You have conceded the liberal position when you make the statement that doctrine doesn't matter. Now, I want you to understand me this morning so you don't leave confused. I'm not saying that there is not room for doctrinal disagreement lovingly. But we should contend for faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. We should seek to come to a right understanding. You see, people always have this excuse. Well, Jay, doctrine divides. It's true. Turn to Genesis chapter 3. Turn with me. Genesis chapter 3. The earth was was created by divine fiat, by a kind and wise and loving God who was seeking His own glory and worship from those He had created. He loved Adam and Eve He gave them everything that they need to be nourished and to flourish. He saw that it was not good that Adam would be alone in the garden, and so he made Eve, in fact. And then we find here this idea that doctrine divides. Of 
Of course it divides. Look in verse 1 of chapter 3 of Genesis. Now the serpent was more crafty. Mark that word in your mind. Satan was crafty. Than any other of the beasts of the field that the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. There in that moment was a doctrinal distinction. The fall of Adam and Eve when they chose to reject the words of God and to live for their own purpose and to side with Satan that they would not surely die. When they took the lies of Satan over the words of God, there is a clear chasm of a doctrinal divide. And you and I, and every human being who has lived since them come to the realization that the truth is doctrine does divide. And in fact, has divided every person who is born naturally from the living God. Doctrine does divide and it is important for our doctrine to be right that our actions would flow out of our doctrine. You see, Adam and Eve, when they reached up to grab the fruit, were not concerned about their relationship with God. They were not concerned about their doctrine. They were concerned about what was pleasing to them. Their doctrine, in fact, led them to damnation. Does doctrine divide? It absolutely divides. Doctrine divides those who seek to honor the, the, the living God from those in this world who are yet dead in their trespasses and sins. Doctrine divides in the church from men who would stand and love the flock of God with the truth of God's Word from those who simply play religious games. Doctrine does divide. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I think it's, it's uh, R.C. Sproul said it best because we live in a day and age when so many people will just say, look, we shouldn't be concerned about doctrine. Sproul said this, and I agree 110%. In fact, it was Dallas Johnson that reminded me of this last week after I got done preaching. R.C. Sproul said, a church that is not concerned about doctrine is a dead church. You can have thousands of people in the auditorium. You can sing songs with all the gusto. But if you are not rooted in the, in the, in the substantial doctrines of Scripture, you are not genuinely worshiping. We must concern ourselves with doctrine. So how do we get to this place of being in a childish state of belief? We get there by being tossed around by our fickle heart and every wind of doctrine. It's all over the place, folks. I can tell you for a young pastor, it is a daunting task to face a world filled with false doctrine. And it's not daunting because I don't believe the Word of God is sufficient. It's daunting because from amongst my brothers and sisters, I hear these words so often. Well, does it really matter? It does matter because we live quorum Deo. We live before the very face of the living God. We do not do doctrine in some closet removed from the holiness of God. We conceive of who He is in His very presence. So how do we arrive at a childish faith? By every wind of doctrine, by picking up all of the junk that is around us. Consider a tornado that the winds are swirling and the debris is leveled against a, a, around a church and there's just junk scattered for miles. And I would continue with you this morning that, that often what the church has done is she leaves the sanctuary and she just goes out and she just picks up whatever she can haphazardly. Instead of coming back and hearing the very words of God and building her doctrine here, we're building doctrine on all the junk that has been thrown around, uh, outside around us. I want you to see clearly this morning that the operative word in this phrase in verse 14 is that there is deception. So that you may no longer be tossed to and fro 
uh, like ch- uh, no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. That word deceitful there, it means error. It means straying from the truth. It means living in false teaching. It means walking under lies. Again, this is strong language, but what we need to learn here is that there is very real consequences to believing false doctrine. So where does this false doctrine come from? Well, the, the, the Apostle Paul gives us a clear, very clear, lucid picture of where this false doctrine comes from. It comes from human cunning, he says in verse 14. He, the, the word here, cunning, or, or excuse me, human cunning, the, the, the word in the Greek is kubaya. I know most of you didn't grow up in a Greek culture, so I'll explain it to you. Cubia is the word where we derive the word cube. What Paul is saying to the church here is that false doctrine comes into the church by human cunning, by those who are like dice players. They play games with doctrine. He's literally saying this is dicey doctrine. False doctrine is always contrived by human beings who see problems and they play fast and loose with the truth. What Paul is saying to us this morning, dice games are nothing new, and if you're acquainted with them, you know that dice games are, absol- are often uh, manipulated easily. You can throw, in fact, I can tell you this firsthand because I'm really good at deceiving someone with, well, not necessarily good at it, but I, I, there's a game that we play at Christmas time where you put a hat on, you put uh, work gloves on, and you have to unwrap a present, and you're going around the room, and you have to uh, roll dice to hit your number. And then when you hit your number, you pass the present to the next person. They have to do all of this goofy stuff, and it's more for laughs than it is for what you get in the end. But my rule is, as soon as, as soon as you hit your number, pick the dice up and throw them behind you, because that gives you more time to unwrap the present. And you get more advantage. And that is exactly how all of this false doctrine has crept into the church by people who want to gain advantage over the church. They're not concerned with the Lordship of Christ. You see, these people are cunning. While you're not watching, they carefully, men move in and they tip the dice in their direction. That way their job is more lucrative and their house is all the more richer. Doctrine is contrived because, frankly, friends, pastors want to be successful and they want that more than being faithful and the apostle Paul here is describing the false teachers who will come with pleasure to draw away unsuspecting Christians where after Christ no after themselves he says that men are expert manipulators seeking to entice weak Christians to deceive and mislead friends I want to introduce you this morning To the most cunning preacher you've ever met. This is the one who has twisted it more than anything. The one who has mishandled truth. The one who doesn't care that doctrine exists. The one who just wants to live its own ministry. The one who is subtle with manipulations and deceives from the genuine truth of the word of God. In fact, I don't want to introduce you. I want the prophet Jeremiah to introduce this preacher to you this morning. And he does so in chapter 17 of Jeremiah, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? The most fallen preacher of all of humanity is your own heart. It makes idols constantly for you. It draws you in a direction of listening to a particular type of preacher so that you might not be actually convicted and moved by the word of God, but only comforted. You see, our hearts, in fact, I would tell you that's the whole point of the statement that Paul has already made about being tossed to and fro by the waves. Those waves are the fickleness of our own hearts. You see, the truth is, friends, just because that you think you are right does not mean that your heart itself has not drawn you away and enticed you to believe a lie. 
2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul writes to young Timothy, Indeed, all those who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while the evil impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Many of these people that teach false doctrine teach it because they are deceived into believing it themselves. So where do we come to a childlike faith, childish faith, rather? But by every wind of doctrine that has swirled around the church for over 2,000 years, by human cunning, by those who play dicey games with the Bible, with the Word of God. And finally, he qualifies how they do this, how this human cunning, how these uh, cunning, these, 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 uh, these games are played out by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Children are taken captive, enticed by the whims of their hearts. This is done so often through the deception of other people. And Paul here now, again, qualifies what instruments of deception are used. He says, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. That, that word schemes there is uh, the word methodia. That there is a method to their madness. That I think if you have a King James Version uh, this morning, verse 14 will read something like, uh, they lie in wait. And it gives you a picture of like an animal who is wanting to ambush his prey. And the prey doesn't even know that the falsehood exists but that, 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 or, or that the predator exists, but is just going along about life, living happily, not even concerned with the warning signs all around him. And then the animal pounces. And so it is with false teachers that they build up schemes. I remember as a young man, I was saved at a young age, but I... I, I trafficked the Lord brought me through a few different um, groups that I would consider to be false teachers and I can remember one of them coming to my house and and laying up a pyramid of cups and they laid this first foundation and they said now this is Jesus and then they laid a second doctrine on top of it. I was probably about 12 years old at the time. And then they laid a third document or uh, doctrine on top of that. And then they laid another doctrine on top of that with these cups until they had built an entire pyramid of absolute what I understand by the grace of God today to be uh, nothing but lies. And then they said, now, son, what you need to understand is if you pull Jesus out from underneath what we're telling you, our whole system collapse, collapses. Um, what I found out was when you hold their entire bunch of cups up to the word of God, it collapses and it is not Jesus that is the foundation of anything that they say. They have a method to draw you away. Most of the, the, the uh, what I would consider absolute rank heretical denominations in our own country today, do you know where they get their converts from? Most often not from the street corner, but from churches where people have already professed the name of Christ. These people have methods. They, they, they are, in fact, deceitful in their schemes. I, I find it interesting that this word, methodia, is only used two times and quite, uh, quite uh, providentially. It's only used two times uh, in the whole New Testament, and both of those times are found in the letter to the church at Ephesus. The other time is Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, when Paul writes, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. The methods that false teachers use are the lies that Satan has given them. Friends, when we do not take doctrine seriously, when we have the attitude that doctrine divides and that, that, we, should re, that we shouldn't be concerned about that, we are buying into the schemes of the devil. The lies, the schemes, no matter how small they are, always belong to Satan. And it's always been that way. Remember our Lord's admonishment again in John chapter 8, verse 44. You are of your father, the devil. He's speaking to religious people here. And your will is to do your father's desires. They had a scheme. They had a religious system. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of all lies. Why does doctrine matter? Because it strips the children of God back into his way of thinking. It, it, it removes the error from our minds. It washes us from the lies that our former father, Satan, had infiltrated our minds with. Doctrine matters because it brings us closer to the living God. 
It strips us of the lies of this world. Doctrine is not old and stale. It's active and helping, and it reveals our own error. Friends, we live in a day and age of utter error constantly. Are you aware that you live in a day and age when the church is is absolutely being pressed upon by the lies of our society? That we are in fact a church that is childish in, in our day and age, and I'm not talking about us necessarily, but we have childish areas in the life of our church, no doubt. Uh, the church at large in America is childish. We care more about the games that are played on the stage than the hearts that are won in our community. We care more about what pleases us than the glory of God. We are, in fact, tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Remember, it was Paul again who said in Acts chapter 20, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, be alert. Do you still believe that doctrine doesn't matter, church? Do you still believe that it, it's no big deal? You see, we believe this lie for, such, for, for so long that our errors don't matter. But remember, we are marching closer and closer to the judgment seat of Christ and we will give an account for everything that is done in the body as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been given this understanding, I think just through the air that we breathe, that error is only a passive thing, that it's only in the negative sense, that we just have a deficit of error, that, that oh, I can believe wrong things, and it's no big deal. Jesus loves me anyway. Well, friend, I want you to rest and rejoice this morning that in all of your errors, if he has brought you to salvation and repentant faith, you are in fact loved of God. There is no doubt about that. But that doesn't mean that error does not matter. And it does not mean that error is merely passive or just in a negative sense. Error is always in a positive, active role. Satan breathed out that first little lie to Eve. You will not surely die. And some people watching could have thought if they didn't have the rest of the Bible, well, that's just a mere negative error. That's just a little bit of falsehood. But that little bit of falsehood led her in a positively destructive direction. Every ounce of error that exists in what you believe will lead you astray and lead you from the living God. You see, we far too often just recycle old lies. We, we don't think it's a big deal if we're wrong. But we must remember every ounce of error is pure evil because it is moving against, it is in fact arrayed against the living God. It is a, it is a rejection of who he is. And to live in error means, again, working contrary to the will and the word of God. And that is no small problem. The most startling problem with the positive, active evil of error, of having false doctrine, of believing things that the Bible doesn't say, is not that it can't be forgiven by Christ, but that it, 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 it ultimately, if it is held by a, a one who is in Christ, that it is in fact part of your sin that Christ atoned for. That it's part of what we should lay down. We should, as a church, be concerned about our doctrine, be concerned about where we have error, and be begging our brothers and sisters in Christ, please help me to see where I have holes in my doctrine, in my understanding, because I want to lay those errors down that I might live unto, the, un, unto Christ. You see, I want you to pay attention to one more word here in verse 14. He says, by craftiness, disqualifying the methods, the schemes, the lies that are all around us, the winds that, that winds have carried around the church today, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Craftiness simply means subtly. By, by subtly deceiving in their methodology is, is what Paul is saying. 
We subtly, without even seeing our own error of church, will work against Christ if we're not careful. It is the reality of all of those who will find doctrine amiss in the last days. People who thought, well, we believed right, doctrine really didn't matter, so we just want to do what we think is best to do, and we're not concerning ourselves with what we are doing, being tied to a doctrinal position. We just want to do what we in our hearts conceive is right. And Jesus lovingly again raises a warning and reminds us, Matthew chapter 7, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, and those who do the will of the Father are distinctly doctrinal people because they have listened to the word of the living God. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name or cast out demons in your name or do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. He might as well have said, depart from me, you that work positively error against my will. You who work false doctrine. It's weighty, isn't it? It's difficult. How do we, knowing that there's so much false teaching around us, and knowing that by refuting false teaching we grow into maturity in Christ, how do we identify these subtle schemes? I want to give you one thing to remember today if you remember nothing else. There is one way to be able to to see a subtle scheme, a subtle methodology from a mile away. And I'll do it by drawing your attention to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. When Peter writes, and again, Peter is a nothing more than a long warning to the church. For we do not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when we received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was borne to Him by majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Do you not see that the picture there of aiming at the transfiguration is the glorification of Christ? That what, Paul, what Peter rather lifts before our eyes as the way to uh, be, be able to discern the craftiness of deceitful schemes is the glory of Christ and the preeminence of Christ in all things. False teachers uh, works ultimately, false teacher teaching rather, works to undermine the glory and the preeminence of Jesus Christ in all things. When, you, when, when someone espouses to you a doctrine, whether it be large or small, hold it up to the light of who Jesus Christ is. As you are pursuing truth, hold before you the living Christ who bled and died for you and hold that doctrine before His glory. And if it stands for His glory, it is true. If it somehow marginalizes His glory, it is false. False system will reduce the truth of the Bible to mere foolishness and human works. The Bible itself tells us that the flesh is no help at all, but we are filled in a religious day and age with men who are applauded by the congregation who stand and compel people, just pray this prayer and everything will be right for you eternally. What a subtle, damnable lie because that is found nowhere in all of Scripture. My question for you this morning, church, if this methodology, if this subtle scheme is so true and we cling so closely to it, why don't we ever find Jesus one time asking people to bow their heads, close their eyes, and raise their hands? Why don't we ever... Now, I want you to understand something. If you came to salvation through a, a broken system, I, want, I just want to pause here because I don't want to cause undue difficulty. But if you came through some of these deceptive methodologies that are religious, I want you to understand that God is gracious enough to use broken means for His perfect end. Amen. Okay? I want you to understand that. But if you told me this morning that somebody was saved in a crack house last night, 
I would not set the church's money to building crack houses that people might come to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Just because, just because God works efficaciously in the face of error doesn't mean we should join in it. People say, well, just do these works, do these things. Go to this gathering, give this much money, and then God will be pleased. Raise all of that before the living Christ, the one who bled and died and told you in John chapter 6 and John chapter 10 that, the, that, that His sheep, who Christ has given, or who God the Father has given Him before the very foundation of the world, will hear His voice and come to Him. Hold all of this religious junk before that Savior who bled and died for you for His glory and see if it adds up. And far too often, what you will learn is that it merely doesn't. People always want to add to the work of Christ. Well, Jesus accomplished what you needed for salvation, but you need to do this thing to receive it. Paul already told us that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. There's nothing we can do spiritually to gain salvation, to be born again. It is something that the Spirit of the living God does alone. We cannot add anything to what He has done because it diminishes His glory. And that is how we discern false error. See, Charles Spurgeon said this, and I've, re I've repeated this often, but I hope it lodges in your heart. Discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It's knowing the difference between right and almost right. To determine truth from error, you must stop asking questions. How does this affect me? How does this affect my religious past? How does this affect my denominational heritage? And you must begin, if the church is ever to grow up and be mature in Christ, we must begin to ask the question, does this in any way diminish the glory of our risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ? Think about this, friends. When we come to matters in our day and age of things like human sexuality and the church is answering these questions, well, does it really matter how you express yourself privately in that particular area of your life? You, and this is what the modern church will say, you do whatever makes you happy. And if it diminishes the glory of God, no big deal. But we are to hold up every ounce, every area of our life to the glory of Christ. And if it does not bring Him honor, if it does not bring Him more glory, then it is a, it is a positive, active, complete lie of Satan. Or apply this text to your salvation. People will say, well, God has done all that He, need, that he can do on His end. Now the rest is up to you. You need to do this. You need to do that. Question this morning for the glory of Christ in the face of all we have seen in Ephesians chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4 is simply this. Did you come to Christ or did Christ come to you? Well, we have that answer. Ephesians chapter 2, you were dead and He brought you to life. In Him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things to the counsel of His will. Sorry, this is Ephesians chapter 1. So that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of His glory. We understand our own salvation rightly when we see that there was nothing we could do to garner the favor of the living God, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and that the only reason He saved us was not because of a profession of faith, but because it would bring Him everlasting glory. To Him alone, throughout all the ages, be glory forever. In Christ's name, let's pray. Father God, we come before you this morning knowing that there are subtle lies that rise up in the church. That we put our salvation in the hands of religious men and not in yours. And we do that erroneously. Father, I pray 
that you would be gracious and kind to each of us today and enlighten our heart and help us to understand where it is that we have believed wrongly, what it is we have taken as a faithful fact that can't actually be backed up in the Word of God. I pray that we would be a church who loves your Word and doesn't just look in it from time to time on the weekends, but that we live in it constantly throughout the week. Father, I pray that we would be a church that proclaims continually that you save, that by, by sending your Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, that he lived a perfect life on our behalf, Lord, atoning for our sin on the cross, dying and picking up our penalty, that he was buried and that he rose again, that all who believe on him might not perish, but that they would have everlasting life. I pray that we would be a church that raises that banner high, that we wouldn't play games with the sum total of Scripture, and that we would be honest about the fact that none of us would ever come to you if it were not the will of the Father. Father, you have the words of eternal life. Let them be the form and substance of our doctrine, not the religious thoughts of men. In Christ's name, amen. Your grace